quiet silence of a heart that believes itself defeated by loss, by pain, by fear. Our hope nailed to a cross, our own faith depleted at the sight of no movement, a body inert. But it is not the end. At the sound of the gravestone rolling, a new story has unfolded. Death has been defeated. Our hope is alive. Jesus is alive. We raise our hands in victory. By his resurrection, we are set free. He blows a wind of life and brings us back to the light. He is risen. Our Messiah is alive. He breathes and the darkness trembles. He speaks and our future shines. By his sacrifice, we are now saved. By his grace, we can all rise. Here rejoicing in the sky, the grave could not hold him. The veil has been torn. Our Christ has won over death, over sin, over ache. By his power, all chains break. He is victorious. He is the way. He is the resurrection and the life. And by his wounds, we're made alive. Hallelujah. If you can, and if you will this morning, please stand with us as we worship our risen Savior, Jesus. It's a wonderful day, amen. I was buried beneath my shade.
guys go ahead and have a seat. Welcome to uh, the second service here on this beautiful Easter Sunday. Uh, we've had uh, a great time of worship with the ones who were here at 9 o'clock, and we welcome you to this service. The Easter story according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise? And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose, and he ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for what you did on that remarkable, one-of-a-kind Sunday morning. We thank you, Father, for the power and the glory that were on display in the resurrection of Jesus. We thank you, God, that you've recorded, you've preserved these stories for us so that we can see that people come to believe in different ways at different times. Some believe quickly. Some need to see for themselves. Some need to hear the stories And yet, God, you are there drawing each one to faith. And I pray that that would be taking place in this worship service. That those who do not yet believe will be drawn by your work in their life to believe the truth of these events. To believe that, God, you have conquered all the enemies, all the true enemies that we have in this world. Sin, Satan, death. You're victorious over all. So we come before you this morning grateful that you've invited us to know you and to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You'll stand with us this morning. We're going to continue to worship. And this is one of my favorites. When I was growing up, if you know it, please sing along with us because it's a great song. We're going to do some singing.
that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior knelt to wash our feet now at his feet we
Blessed day we come before you with hearts 
overflowing with gratitude and praise, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your glorious resurrection, Lord, for conquering sin and death and granting us the gift of eternal life. In your infinite mercy and love, you sacrificed yourself for us, Lord, bearing the weight of our sins upon the cross. But on this miraculous day, Lord, you rose from the grave, triumphed over all darkness and despair with joyous hearts. Lord, we lift our voices in thanksgiving, celebrating the victory you have won for us, Lord. And your resurrection fills us with hope, Lord, and it fills us with courage and unwavering faith. And may we never forget the magnitude of your sacrifice and the boundless love you have shown us. Lord, strengthen our faith. Lord, guide us always in your light. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your resurrection and for the promise of salvation it brings. And with grateful hearts, Lord, we praise your holy name now and forever. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity. Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line. Between old and new, between death and life, there stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. I love the creativity of uh, that little piece and the reminder of uh, how the resurrection is at the center and everything rises or falls in our entire faith as Paul argues in Corinthians uh, upon whether the resurrection uh, really did happen or not. Uh, so we're going to uh, together uh, spend some time this morning in this uh, passage of Luke 24 that you've already heard read, and uh, I'll work uh, through that uh, together with you over the next few minutes. Uh, every Easter, I, since I, I first read this a number of years ago, I remember Brennan Manning in, a, in one of his books, um, told the story of how he had become familiar with uh, the practice of Orthodox monks. That would be the Eastern uh, Church uh, centered in Greece and that, that part of the world. How their monks, many years ago, uh, some of them were sitting in their monastery where they lived and served, and uh, someone observed that 
Easter must have been the greatest cosmic joke ever played or ever told. And uh, as, as he tried to explain what he was saying, he said, picture God on resurrection morning speaking to the devil who is convinced that because of what happened on Friday, the crucifixion and the death and the burial of Jesus, that Satan was convinced he had won. And then God looking at Satan and speaking to him on Sunday morning early that day, saying, Satan, watch this. Just watch this. And Christ is raised. And so the, the, the brothers in the monastery all had a, a good belly laugh with, with just imagining that scene. And then it evolved over the years into a practice that the Eastern Orthodox monks still follow today. That on Easter Monday, they did, the day after celebration of the resurrection, they have saved up their best jokes from the entire previous year. And they spend the day from morning till evening telling one another their best jokes and celebrating the reality that true joy is rooted back in the resurrection of Christ. So think about that, not only today, but uh, perhaps tomorrow as uh, you go through your day and probably get back into the routine of uh, your life. Think about the difference that resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus, and therefore the potential resurrection of believers, uh, what, what difference that truly makes. For me, Easter has been always an intensely personal uh, day because it was when I was 10 years old on an Easter Sunday night, so that was, what, 30 years ago? <laughs> Maybe a few more. Um, but at the age of 10 on an Easter Sunday night at church, um, there was a call to trust Christ as Savior. And uh, I remember with great clarity uh, my going down and telling the pastor what I wanted to do. And that was an environment where we were all pretty well convinced that you couldn't become a Christian unless you were uh, talking to the pastor uh, to do it. And so I did what I had been trained to do, and he did lead me in a prayer where I acknowledged my sin and I genuinely trusted Christ and asked him to be my Savior and my Lord. Now, something I forgot to tell the first service crowd, if they didn't know it already, a few of you know this, this is also, Easter is also the birthday of Crossroads Church. So 1990, Sandy was there, 1990, Easter Sunday morning was the first public worship service for this church. So uh, Easter has a multitude of layers of meaning uh, for, for many of us. I find myself in most years being drawn back to Luke's gospel for some of the scenes, some of which are very unique to Luke. You remember, if you have been here for the early uh, days of our, our working uh, the sermon series through the entire Gospel of Luke, I reminded you or, or shared with you that Luke, while he was a doctor, uh, physician by training, uh, he was quite the historian. And he carefully researched and interviewed people who were eyewitnesses. Whenever he could find an eyewitness uh, or no more than one generation, one, one uh, telling of a story removed. He would go to those people and make copious notes. And God used that research to eventually inspire the scripture that we know as the gospel of Luke. And so as we go through this story, I want you to keep that in mind. That this is, this is eyewitness accounting of what it was like on the first Easter morning. Tim Keller wrote that Easter proves that Christmas was real. Easter puts an exclamation point on the coming of the Son of God into this world. Easter is the proof in the resurrection that it really was a miraculous birth. It wasn't just another 
baby boy being born into Judea. It was the Son of God miraculously born, miraculously dying on a cross for a purpose of providing salvation for us, and miraculously being raised from the dead. So these are intimate memories of people who were there. Keep that in mind as we work our way back through the Scripture. The big idea for today, if there was no resurrection of Jesus, then what you're left with is only living for this moment. And with whatever understanding and strength that we have ourselves, within ourselves, to face life and to face death. You remove God from it, what are you left with? You're left with yourself. Your own understandings, your own strength for those pivotal moments in life and in death. But if Jesus was resurrected from a state of death, then this is Paul's argument in Corinthians. There is a basis for all of our faith. There is a basis for hope and purpose in this life. There is power to be saved. Once again, I keep referring to Paul, but so many of his writings come back to my mind as I read these words. Paul argues that the very power that resurrected Jesus is the same power that saves us and gives us power to be obedient to God. So that's the argument of Scripture, that if the resurrection happened, there is power to be saved from your sin. There is power to be obedient to God. Now, every pastor, every preacher I've ever talked to about this feels a weird sort of pressure about Easter. And I've tried to get out from under that and uh, ask the Lord to give me freedom from it. But it's something we all tend to wrestle with. And so one of the other customs that I have over these last few years is to go back and read again what then a very young pastor wrote to friends of his who were also pastors. Daniel Dickard said, your worship service, remember this as you plan for Easter, your worship service doesn't have to be spectacular this Easter Sunday because Christ is spectacular. The resurrection is supernatural. Just preach Christ and your worship will be spectacular and supernatural. And so that's what we try to present to you this morning is the spectacular risen Christ who is the only one who can save us from our sin. All right, with that, let's look back at Luke 24. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. Now, what that tells me is that on that awful day, a day that must have been awful, Saturday, they were not sitting idly, but that these women had given thought to and had conversation and made plans for what they needed to do the next morning. On Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, they're sort of locked in to their homes there, there are all kinds of restrictions about what they can do. They can't go and, and take care of the things that they want to take care of on Sunday morning, which namely is the body of Christ, the body of their dear friend Jesus. They know that in the rush of what happened on Friday, Jesus is taken down off the cross late in the afternoon. He is placed in a borrowed tomb. No one had time to adequately appropriately prepare his body for burial. And so all, all through the intervening hours until Sunday morning, these women are discussing with each other, we need to go. You know what an, what a, what an honoring thing it is to care for the dead and the families of the dead. And so they, they make their plans to take these spices, which are traditionally used for as a form of embalming for a form of honoring of the deceased and the remains that are there. And they make their way as early in the morning as is possible. And at verse 2 it says, when they got there, when they get to the graveyard, to the cemetery, they find that the stone had been rolled away. Now don't picture a big massive orb, a round boulder, Picture something like you've seen in more recent depictions of this in television and in movie, uh, movies that you might have uh, gone to see. A round, something uh, that you would picture in a, uh, a gristmill. 
uh, a round stone that would look something like a wheel, and it's flatter and much wider. And there is a groove in a wealthy person's tomb. There is going to be a groove carved out of stone that is on the ground so that when they need to, they can roll this stone away and they can put the remains. More than one person is going to be buried in a family tomb uh, where, where it is owned by someone of the means of the man who, who loaned his uh, for the use of Jesus. So they go there and the door is open. And that startles them as it would any of us. What has happened? Have grave robbers shown up since Friday evening? But they, 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 as they're taking this in, verse 2 says they found the stone rolled away. And verse 3 says, but when they went in, they stepped inside the tomb. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And their mental intellectual, their emotional response, they were perplexed. They, they were confused, as any of us would be. How do you make sense of this scene? They were perplexed about this, and behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. It is clearly a description of angelic beings, though the, the Bible, Luke's gospel, just simply stops at calling them men, but men of unusual appearance. This dazzling word is used to describe the light that emanates from them. And they were frightened. So you got the mental confusion. I'm perplexed. I don't know what to do with this information. You've got the emotional response, fear. And it says they responded physically then by bowing their faces to the ground. And the men, the angels, said to them these famous words, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why are you actually expecting to find someone who is alive? Now, they didn't know he was alive yet, but the angels know he's alive. So why are you looking for the living in a place of death? Fair question, isn't it? They're doing what they understood. Verse 6, he's not here. Angels continue to say, he is not here. He has risen. And then gives them some spiritual guidance. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Their heads must have been exploding. Their heads must have been spinning. Think back. And you, you ever had one of those moments where something is said or something occurs and your mind goes into to, to warp speed operation and, and you're, you're just reliving all kinds of conversations and moments. That's what the angels have asked them to do. Do you not remember what the one you're looking for said to you? Sometimes, a long time ago, some of it more recently, but while he was still in Galilee, he told you, he told you that he must be crucified. He must be delivered into the hands of the sinful men and be crucified. And he will, though, be resurrected. All this must happen. Sometimes the, the truth is, we just need to be reminded of what Jesus has already said to us. Verse 9, in returning from the tomb, I'm sure there probably were a lot of words exchanged among the women. Uh, do the angels immediately dissipate? Do they go away and leave them standing there for a moment? We're not sure of all those kinds of details, but surely they must have had quite the conversation running back to where the other disciples are, are that morning, early on Sunday. And they go back to the 11 disciples who are remaining. Judas has committed suicide in his shame and his refusal to come back for restoration to Christ. He takes his life. So there are only 11 of them left, uh, plus a very large contingent of other followers of Jesus. They remembered 
his words. And returning from the tomb, they go back and they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, who was there among them? Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But listen to the response of the men. And all the women in the room, you have full permission and right to be offended. Okay? So get ready. You can be offended by this. Because what's the apostles' response to the women? The words that they told seemed to them to be an idle tale. And the words idle tale mean an incoherent set of nonsense are just babbling. So they are completely dismissed. Everybody in the room, it seems, except maybe a couple of guys who were the exception, may, may, maybe they say things that are outwardly derogatory toward these women. Maybe it's just an internal rejection of the possibility of the crazy story that they are saying but for the large part, they consider what they've just heard nonsense. But Peter and John, they stand up. And there is something inside of them that wants to go see for themselves. And they take off running for the tomb. They run toward the place where these women have just been. So, as the scene shifts, as the men reach the tomb, it says the majority of those who had heard the story did not believe them, but Peter rose and he ran to the tomb. Luke just tells us about Peter. John was, was also there. We know that from one of the other Gospels. And when Peter gets there, he stoops and he looks in. And what does he see? the linen cloths by themselves. What I've read is that the language here reinforces the idea that everything is in order. There is in an empty tomb an orderliness to the wrappings that previously had been on the body of Jesus. So many Bible scholars, they say, what, what, what is being described here by Peter is what the cloths would look like if the body of Christ just came through the cloth. And the strips of linen, the wrappings are left where they would have been had his body still been lying there. And Peter, Luke is concentrating on Peter, Peter went home marveling at what had it happened. And what has happened? Resurrection. He's not marveling at what happened to him yet. He is marveling at what he has come to believe has happened with Jesus. That Jesus is not dead. He was dead, but he's not dead anymore. And his mind must be flooding with the same experience that the angels called the women to have. Think back, remember all the times that he talked to you about this. Remember sometimes they were in obscure words that didn't make sense at the time. You thought he was talking about the physical temple when he said, if you tear down this temple, in three days it's going to be built back. You thought he was talking about the physical temple. He was talking about the very presence of God with you, his body. You kill it three days later. He's back. All right, some lessons that we learn from this very dramatic story that takes place in a graveyard. Now, graveyards look different then than they do now, but still, that's what it is. It's a place where you put the bodies of people who've died. What did the disciples learn from that, what is normally thought of as a very sad and defeating sort of environment? 
They learned this, number one, that even when God is silent, he remains sovereign. I don't think there's much question. Some of these women and some of the men, maybe more of the men than the women, have gone through this awful stretch of time from the moment they pulled the body of Jesus off of the cross and they put it into the tomb. And that Friday night and all day Saturday, and then Saturday night into these early hours of Sunday, months, many of them must not have felt like they were hearing God. And that's a pretty common experience, isn't it? We get into places, we get into circumstances where we can't hear God. But I want to ask you, what is your, what is your understanding of where God is when he's silent? They came to understand God was still on his throne. God was still in control. The circumstances didn't bear that out from what they were often seeing. But the reality was that God was still in control and God was orchestrating all of history. For obvious reasons, we bear our focus on Friday and on Sunday morning, but consider what it was like to be a follower of Jesus on Saturday when you can't hear God. Do you still believe in a God who is in control even when you can't hear his words? A second lesson from the graveyard, failure to know or to remember God's promises will leave you in the same position that the women were in initially, same position that all the disciples back at the house were in, you will find yourself perplexed and frightened. I'm so grateful, again, for the detail that Luke gives us. He doesn't just say, and they were there, and angels appeared, and angels said, this is what's taken place. He goes to the trouble. The Holy Spirit inspires him to give us these details. They couldn't make any sense of this. They were perplexed. They were scared out of their skin. They, they, they didn't know what to do other than to get down on their faces in front of these angelic messengers from God. But if you, that's what happens if we don't know the promises of God. If we don't remember in the worst moments of our lives, we don't remember the promises of God. And that's why it is so important that the angels say to the women, don't you remember? Back when you were still in Galilee, when Jesus was still in Galilee with you, he said these things must happen. It, it's, it's not a bunch of happenstance, these circumstances, that God is sort of figuring out how to work for his good and for his glory through these random events. This was all a plan that the Father had. And everything is going according to the Father's plan. But if you don't know what God has promised you, all you will see is the blur of confusion and the unexplained, unexplainable pain that you feel in the midst of life's circumstances. A third lesson from the graveyard. If we're going to remember God's word, God's promises, then we must first know his word. Now, we have such an advantage. You, you think they had advantages, and there were some, like being able to physically walk with Jesus, to actually talk with him, to, to be in his presence. Absolutely. Wouldn't that be an amazing experience? But here's what you have, and I have, that they didn't have. We have the inspired word of God. Everything God believed, God knew that we needed to know that he has said was inspired and preserved for us. And so today, there is actually no excuse for any of us not to know what God has said and not to know his promises. And you find yourself in the middle of something that, is, that has a pain level that you can't even put a number on? All right, what has God promised that's important in this moment? What is there about God and his nature that you need to remember? These are the patterns that are displayed on, on, on Easter Sunday morning that we can see in the lives of these women, and eventually, eventually the men catch up with where the women are in their faith. 
Number four, we're all in favor of resurrection, right? I think if we had a vote, resurrection wins. We're in favor of resurrection. But to experience resurrection, there has to first be a death. And that's where a lot of us went off the train. Oh, God, I believe you have the power to raise your son to life. I believe you did that. I believe you have the power to resurrect us after our physical death. If we have been saved, if our faith is in your son, that you will resurrect your children. We believe those things. We just want to, don't want to deal with the death part. The son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. He must be crucified. He must then on the third day arise, rise from the dead. All these things must happen. It is the plan of God. It has to be. It's not a bunch of unfortunate circumstances. This had to happen in this sequence. By the way, that's true of us spiritually. We want resurrection power in our lives. We want the very power and presence of God that Mary and all the other women and, and again, eventually the men begin to experience of the resurrected Jesus, guess what? There's got to be a death before that resurrection power is real in us. That's why Jesus said, you've got to pick up your cross, deny yourself, die to self, and then you can live. So every day, I've got to go through this process again, not of being saved again, but of deciding that, that Christ's life is more important than my life. I have to die to self in order for his life to be lived and expressed through me. Number five, just pretty simple and not a lot of elaboration on this. Not everyone's going to believe your story about Jesus. Have you found that to be true? Jesus has done amazing things in your life, and you want to tell people about it. And some people are very receptive, and some people say, all right, you know, I'm not into that. Leave me alone. Not everybody believes your story about Jesus. Sometimes, even within the church, people don't believe your story about Jesus. It's, it's just a reality. And all you can do is step back, be faithful in witnessing in the way that Christ calls you to witness, and leave the results in the hands of God. A sixth, the final lesson from the graveyard. Faith is a personal experience. And it's a personal choice that each person has to make for themselves. So you couldn't help but notice, right, that the women come to faith in a different way than the men do. The women are there first. They see an empty tomb. They hear from the angel. They hear from an angel. Peter didn't hear from an angel. They hear from an angel what, is, what has happened. They are told, think back to the words of the one you came to minister to. And by the end of those conversations, they are believers. They are trusting that resurrection has happened. Peter, John, they're not going to take their word for it. They have to see for themselves. They have to go and investigate. They have to look into that tomb, walk in for themselves, evaluate everything that they're seeing, take it all in, and then they come to the same conclusion, but in a different way. Trent Br Butler wrote this, denying Peter was also impulsive, inquisitive Peter. The women's story pricks his conscience, and it challenged him to go take a look for himself. Here's the open tomb. He takes it in. Peter easily entered the tomb. His response is such an easy, to such easy access is not recorded. The two men, Peter and John, did not, or, or, I'm sorry, the two men, the angels, did not appear to Peter and to John. All the evidence that Peter had to go on were the cloths. That was the clincher for him. That wasn't the clincher for the women. So they all wind up at the same place of trusting Jesus, but by different means. This same Peter... A few years after this, when God has shaped him, disciplined him, 
formed him to be more like Christ. He writes a couple of letters. They bear his name. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, still in the opening words of that letter, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Now, if you are among the many people, maybe even a majority of people, maybe even a majority of churches in the world believe some form of, by my own actions, I will achieve salvation. This verse is going to trouble you. And I want it to trouble you. Because what Peter does here is to say, my salvation and the salvation of anyone who is born again is because God first started to work in our lives. It was according to his mercy, not our works. According to his mercy, he caused us to be born again. Why do you desire Christ? Why are you willing to repent? Why are you willing to trust him? Because God was first working in your conscience, in your heart, in your mind to convince you this is true. This is true. So God causes people to be born again. To what? To a living hope. Look, all these years later, Peter's not gotten over the resurrection. God causes us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our very salvation is dependent upon the resurrection. If there wasn't power to raise Christ from the dead, there's not power to raise you and me spiritually from being dead before God. But through that same resurrection power, he causes us to be born again to a living hope rooted in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable. This is your salvation. How does Peter describe it? It's imperishable. It's never going to waste away. It is undefiled. It is unfading. And who's holding on to it? Once again, get over any thought you have in your mind that you are clinging to your salvation by your fingernails. And that it's dependent upon your absolute faithfulness in every circumstance or you will lose your salvation. What does Peter say here? What does the Word of God say? This inheritance, this spiritual inheritance that God has for you is being kept in heaven for you. God has it. God has it. He's keeping it for you. No one can take it away from God. It reminds you of those words of Jesus. You're in the Father's hands, and no one can take you from the grip of the Father's hand imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power, this salvation is being guarded through faith. So there we are. If you want to have a part in it, there's your part. You have to believe. You have to trust. You have to do the same thing Peter did and John did and all those women did and all the disciples that were waiting to hear what was really going on over at the graveyard. They all had to individually come to a decision about whether they had faith in Jesus, a resurrected Jesus, kept through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You see, there will be a day when faith is not required because what is faith? Faith is believing something you can't see. Faith is believing something you can't handle, you can't dissect. It is a declared truth that you've decided you believe, you trust. So there will be a day you don't require faith in the day when Christ comes to get his children. The fullness of salvation will be revealed to us. And we'll no longer have to be talking about things we can't see things we can't touch. It will be revealed and seen by all. The merciful God who saves us by grace, by an act of his mercy, and keeps us by grace will say, come here, live forever with me in the salvation that I have given you. So I want to close with three 
Easter challenges. Number one, because of the resurrection, you can be born again if you've never been born again. And the question that goes with that, will you trust in God's mercy to save you this morning? The second Easter challenge in the resurrection, we can see what really matters. Man, part of it, you say a lot about this, but part of what really matters is that death is not the end. Death is not the final word on your life, on your existence. God made you for eternity, and the only, only thing that remains unanswered for some of us is where will that eternity be spent? The question I want you to consider this morning, will you choose to treasure Christ above all? To love Christ more than life itself. And the third Easter challenge, the resurrection of Jesus and therefore the meaning of the cross and the salvation that he offers you is a matter of faith. You have to decide whether you believe. You don't get to ride there on the coattails of somebody else's faith. Do you believe? Do you trust? And what we offer this morning, the scriptures... God's church, what we offer this morning is so much better than just having a positive outlook on life, some form of optimism. J.I. Packer said so wisely, optimism is a wish without a warrant. We don't want you to hope so. We want you to know so. J.I. Packer went on to say, Christian hope is a certainty guaranteed by God himself. Optimism reflects ignorance as to whether good things will ever actually come. You simply hope so. But Christian hope is different. It expresses knowledge that every day of his life and every moment beyond it, the believer can say with truth on the basis of God's own commitment that the best is yet to come. You may have had a great life so far. I'm truly happy for you if you have. But this life will pale in comparison to what God has prepared for you. If you will only believe, if you will only trust in this risen Savior. Just like the women and just like Peter and just like John, you have to decide what do you believe about Jesus. So we unashamedly plead with you this morning, fall at the feet of the merciful risen Jesus. And ask him to do what no one in this room deserves. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask him for a relationship with God. Ask him for salvation as you trust him. Elizabeth Elliot said, where reasons are given, we don't need faith. Where only darkness surrounds us, we have no means for seeing except by faith. So she's talking about in the meantime. Right now, it is a matter of faith. There is plenty of historical evidence, but actually it comes down to this. Are you willing to trust yourself? With your heart, your mind, are you willing to trust Christ and what the Bible declares took place on that first Easter Sunday morning? Let's pray together. Father, as we come to you, we are so grateful that we don't have to go through life alone that you are a God who is not removed. You are a God who has his hands, has his fingers on every aspect of life. You are sovereign always. Even when we can't hear your words, God, you are there on your throne. Lord, I pray for those in this worship service and who may be watching from a distance. I pray for those who've never trusted Christ, who've never confessed sin, who've never received your forgiveness, who've never fallen on your mercy. I pray that they would come to a place of repentance this morning and ask you for what only you can give them. God, we pray that before this day is over, we would have new brothers and sisters in your family. Draw people to salvation. Make people be born again as you work in their lives. And God, 
We pray for your sons and daughters who are here today, who've come desiring to be in your presence, knowing this is the right thing to do. This is the right thing to do with our life, to worship you, not just on Sunday mornings, but with everything that we are, every moment of life. But we've come this morning, carved out a part of our day to be with other sons and daughters of God's. And we fall before you this morning just wanting to say thank you. Thank you for showing yourself to us, for all the words you've spoken to us. <coughs> now, God, help us remember what you've said. Help us to remember your promises. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you would like to stand, you can. If you want to stay seated, it's always okay. But we just want to worship through some music as we respond to God's Word and what He has been saying to us as uh, we've been studying it together this morning. So let's sing. Let's respond. Let's do what God's asking of us.
Hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Easter Sunday. Uh, some quick words before we go. There's a connection card in your bulletin like that. We love to get those, especially when you're telling us how we can be praying for you. Uh, and if you're new to Crossroads, then uh, I promise you we don't overwhelm you with information. But if you want some email uh, announcements uh, to you periodically about special events or changes in the schedule, uh, that's one way to get that information uh, to us. Um, there is, uh, on every fifth Sunday in our church, uh, an opportunity that we call uh, to your attention to give to what we call to the benevolence offering. When somebody um, within the church or somebody out in the community has a need uh, and make us aware of that, that goes to our deacons. They manage the benevolence fund. And uh, it, it uh, has a little bit in it now. A few weeks ago, it was completely tapped out. Uh, but if you like to give to some extra things, uh, don't divert your regular offering. But if you want to give something extra, uh, that really is a blessing to a lot of people over the course of a year. And uh, you can do that either here today or online. You'll find an uh, uh, opportunity there online giving uh, to be able to give to that. Because of uh, just the pattern we established many years ago, uh, the week after Easter, coinciding with a lot of spring break weeks with schools, uh, we, we don't have Wednesday night, and Trail Life is not meeting on Tuesday night. So any of those kinds of things, uh, you've got a, a week off, and we'll be back to a full regular schedule uh, starting next Sunday. Uh, speaking of which, next steps is our Get to Know the Church uh, afternoon. We start right after this service. We will feed you lunch, take care of your kids if you have kids, and uh, answer as many questions as we can about the church and present to you some, some things about us that uh, we think would be of interest to you. Uh, we do need to know that you're coming just to make arrangements for food and child care, so uh, let us know about those. And uh, a couple of other things. There is some information in the bulletin about volunteering to serve in uh, Born to Excel, our Big Kids Week that happens at the, uh, toward the end of June. Uh, registrations are going to open first, we do this every year, first for those who are volunteering, who are actually serving in the week. We give them a little bump to the front of the line. Uh, so if, if you are willing to serve and you want to have that opportunity to get into early registration, um, uh, Rachel Morangiello is our director of Born to Excel this year. Um, you let her know either directly, uh, it is better to use that connection card. Uh, that way it's written down and you're not relying on uh, people's memories. Um, one last, no, two last things. If you're new today, and we've had opportunity to meet so many new people. Uh, we are glad you are here. We hope to see you again. And Vanessa and I are going to be at the back. If you'll come by there, we'll not only get to meet you, but we'll give you a gift bag from our church as our thank you for your coming today. Uh, we had a couple um, at first service that have been corresponding by email for months. They picked our church out from Arizona. Been worshiping with us regularly every week. Uh, came into town 7 o'clock last night. They arrived from Arizona. They were at 9 o'clock worship this morning. Uh, so pretty, pretty amazing story that they have. But we are surrounded by people who are new to the community as well as people who've been here for a while and need a church home. So don't miss opportunities to talk and invite people and uh, to, to just ask them, do you have a church? And would you be interested in coming and worshiping with us? Let them know that. Last thing, I love it when people use their gifts uh, to meet the needs of people and honor Christ. I want you to see, it'd be better if you even walked up to them in a minute, but there are a couple of handrails coming off the uh, stage. One of our guys made not saying anything about the physical condition of this elderly band up here. Uh, we've needed those for a long time. Mike Shoup works as a civilian machinist, welder, and builder of all crazy inventions that they come up with. Uh, in the inner sanctum of Fort Bragg, so some of you know what that means, in the secret of all secret places, uh, that's where he goes to work every day. And they have, they have worked to train him to do 
amazing things. And uh, he took some of those skills, knowing we needed these. And uh, you just you need to go look at the craftsmanship of that. And we appreciate Mike uh, doing that for us. And uh, uh, just 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 thank you, Mike, for what you did for us. All right, that is it. Trey and Band, you're going to lead us out with a song. Remember, Vanessa and I'll be at the back if uh, you'd like to come by there. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow.